Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, one uh, very short thing. I'm really short on time, so I'll have to take all questions at the end, if any. Sorry about that, but it was really complicated to compact the whole thing in uh, the time I had. Um, let's see. Um, and before we start, how many people in this room are team leaders of some sort, managers of some sort? Okay. Good. Uh, I hope you will... Yeah, okay. I hope you will stay for the whole talk. You will understand why I'm saying that. Okay, so if you recognize in this front page uh, some resemblance with a train ticket, travel ticket of some sort, that's exactly the point. Because this is about an experiment that is still ongoing, uh, about uh, shaping my leadership style using Promise Theory. Uh, and it's a, a journey that I started um, a bit more than one year ago when I started in Italian Digital, which is the company I work for. And uh, so to make myself understood, I have to do two things that I never do in any talk. I will have to talk a bit about myself and about the company. Not because you're not smart enough to just look up things in Google or whatever and get your own idea, but because without some of that context, what I'm going to say later makes no sense at all. Um, so yeah, that's, the plan is so to talk about myself and Telenor Digital, then give you just a very few, very few concepts about Promise Theory because again, if you don't have those, this makes no sense at all. Then we try to put this thing all together and uh, try to see how Promise Theory helps and how it may even help more. And then we see some few concrete examples. A lot of stuff for the 40 minutes I have. So, without further ado, myself and uh, Teleno Digital. Myself, the important part about my uh, <coughs> career, okay, well, whatever it is, uh, I've worked uh, quite a lot with CF Engine in my previous company, some uh, four years, I think, quite extensively. And that's an important detail because, uh, as you may know, uh, Mark Burgess wrote Promise Theory to have some theoretical foundation to model CF Engine 3. So, uh, CF Engine 3 is an implementation of Promise Theory. And this means that using the tools so extensively for such a long time, some of the concepts were like hardwired in my brain, so I was able to see some connections with other things that I had around that other people may, have, may not have noticed. And uh, regarding previous experiences as team leaders, team leader, uh, I've been a leader of a small squad of uh, five reports in, for an Italian ISP. And uh, I've been uh, for five months the uh, head of a system group in a regional agency in Italy, where I had eight reports. Terminal Digital is a subsidiary of a much bigger company, uh, which is Telenor is the biggest uh, telephony operator in Norway with subsidiaries in Europe and Asia. But despite being immersed in a very traditional telco environment, it's actually a modern company. And uh, of all those things that you see, uh, the thing that is important to, to have for this experiment is that uh, there is a freedom to experiment try new things, and it's okay to fail when you try to do new things. That's quite an important peculiarity because without that, probably I would not even try it doing the things that I've done. How was IT in Teleno Digital before I joined the company? Well, there was no IT department. There were IT duties scattered over many, many people. But in the end, IT was no one's responsibility. Things were done a bit uh, ad hoc. So there was uh, some technical debt that started to accumulate and uh, they had started to require, uh, they had the requirement to pay it back eventually. So yeah, that's why they decided that they needed a dedicated IT team. And then I joined and that was quite a mess. 
because I was the IT team. Just me. And uh, there were a lot of things to, to learn, a lot of legacy, expectations from very far ends, like on one side you could have the security group who was waiting for you to uh, help fixing some uh, long-standing security problems that they had and they wanted to be fixed. And on the other hand, you had non-technical people who wanted and helped this person. So, you know, very different expectations. And again, one-man team. Basically, I had uh, a lot of people, you know, the, those people that were doing IT stuff around the company, who were still willing to help for all those parts that I couldn't reach. But I could only ask if they could do something for me. But they had other managers. The, like the personal assistants could help, but they had their senior vice president that they worked for and so on. So I basically didn't have any line of command to anyone. I was kind of managing a large team, but I couldn't really command anyone. So the traditional model of leadership, where you have a line of command on some people, you have direct reports, that's not going to work. That can't work, because they don't report to you. Period. End of the story. So I needed something different, completely different to succeed. And, well, the question then is, how can you exploit that independence of the people helping you to succeed? Because that's exactly what makes traditional leadership fail, right? If you command people and people don't execute, then you're not leading in the traditional way. So I don't know what, what's your answer to this question. I guess you will be leaving this room with more questions than when you came in. Because again, it's an ongoing experiment. I can tell you what, uh, what I do usually. What are my principles as a team leader? Uh, I'll have to use uh, one swear word, but after we had Adam and Jacob, I think it's not a problem for anyone. Right? Yeah, it's not a problem for anyone. So, principle number one. When I'm appointed to lead a team, I start with trust. I trust anyone, everyone in the team to know their, their, their things, they know what to do, and I support them. If I have to change my mind, that's up to them. Up to the relationship that they are able to establish with me. But from uh, second zero, from the first moment I, I'm appointed as a team leader, I, have, I start with trust. The second thing is don't be a jerk. So, to be clear, it's not that I'm not a jerk or I cannot be a jerk, depending on the situation. But that's exactly the point. So even if you are very calm and principled and well-behaved and everything, I'm sure you will find someone in your company, at least one person, who will drag that jerk that's hidden inside of you and pull it out. So you will be a jerk eventually. That will happen. That will happen. So you don't have to overdo that. You don't need to prove that you can be a jerk. That will happen naturally. So relax, try to do your job the best that you can. And uh, when it happens that you're a jerk, well, I hope you feel sorry for that. I do. And the third thing, and at this point, someone may want to leave the room. I hope not. Don't impose unless absolutely necessary. What do I mean? There are leaders out there, I hope not inside this room, that want to impose on people just to prove who is on command. Well, if you are that kind of leader, then this talk is not for you. This thing that I'm going to talk about will never work for you. Leave. Promise theory. Second part. Uh, so, 
what is promise theory? According to, I have to read a bit, according to Mark Burgess, promise theory is a generic abstract theory to represent complex systems of any kind and their behavior, starting from the point of view of the system components and their interactions. Complex systems doesn't necessarily mean software or a front end database, whatever. A system, a complex system is made of people, can be made of people, computers, machines, processes, anything. And promise theory can model about anything. One of the powers of uh, promise theory is that we all have been exposed to the concept of promise, right, since early age. Keeping a promise, not keeping a promise, it's something that we know what it means, even if we haven't studied promise theory. So that's actually an important tool, because we are able to abstract using that knowledge to something that is not just personal interactions. Which is a good thing, because again, we are not just talking about people. Uh, so if I will just touch a very few concepts. If you need or want to know more, there is a book. Read it, maybe a few times, because it's, I don't think it's very clear when you read it just one time. Go through the book, we'll just see what is important for us. Key concepts, agents and promises. Basically, an agent is anything that can promise an outcome or a capability. And uh, it makes that promise explicitly or implicitly. Ooh. What does that mean? Let's start easy. That lady with a yellow shirt was a world record holder for a 5K, 10K, marathon, now is a personal trainer. And uh, for example, if you buy her services, she may promise you that in uh, six months she will help you improve your time in running 5K by one minute. Okay? So she's making an explicit promise. She's talking, she's maybe writing, she's telling you something that is promising an outcome. Right? This is easy. But what about this thing? This is the power adapter of my laptop. Well, it's making a promise, even if it's not talking or doing anything. It's promising me to output direct current 19.5 volts, 3.34 ampere. It's a promise that this thing is making, right? And it's not talking. So that's an implicit promise. Or uh, when you buy a wristwatch like this, the absolute minimum that you require from a wristwatch, what it is, that when you watch, look at it, it shows you the time. That's the, at, at least the single promise that you expect from a wristwatch. Then things like that may hold many more promises, but that's the absolute minimum. And again, it's not talking, right? So, all these things are making promises, in one way or another. Now, if you consider this and you have started thinking in terms of promises on these things, you may have some maybe counterexamples or some analogies. I have baked a few one for you. For example, there are agents making promises and agents using promises. If you have only one type of the two, you have nothing. A personal trainer that promises something and nobody uses their service, what is it for? Or if you try to find a personal trainer that helps you to do something and you can find it, is that so important that you are trying to use a promise of someone else? Not really. All the agents that we have talked about make promises voluntarily. There is no one like holding a gun on the head of the personal trainer to offer you something. But even if there was, she can still choose if she prefers 
to be killed rather than promise you something, right? And agents may cooperate with each other to uh, make a bigger promise. We'll see something in a few slides now. So this idea of autonomy and voluntary cooperation is also very important. Uh, this condition about, this thing about conditions, there will be conditions or boundaries about when the promise holds. This thing can uh, make my, that promise to charge my laptop. If I plug it to a 20, uh, 20, uh, 220 volts line, if I plug it to 400 volts, it won't be able to keep the promise forever. Nope. So, yeah, and same for the personal trainer. If you don't follow her advice, she won't be able to keep the promise. You got the idea. Uh, since everything is based on voluntary cooperation and autonomy, an agent may be unwilling to promise you something. You may try to incentivize its will, you may try to impose, and yeah, maybe you'll manage, maybe you, you won't. But that's an important thing. There is another concept, and I need some help. Who in this room have teenager children? Nobody. One. Good. There is one. May I ask you a question? <laughs> okay. So, um, when you ask your teenager child to tidy up his room, who decides if he kept the promise to tidy it up or not? Is it him, her, or is it you? The mother, okay. <laughs> to our, uh, to our uh, experiment is the same. The point is, who assesses if the promise was kept or not? Because it's quite important to decide if the promise was kept or not, right? And uh, is it the agent who makes the promise or the agent who uses the promise? And the answer is, the agent who uses the promise decides. You have been child to someone, so you know what happened when uh, you were requested to tidy up your room, right? If uh, your parents told you, this has to be clean, you have to do that, you have to do that, you just did the things that he pointed out and forgot about the rest. And then your parents would not be happy and then, well, that's what you told me to do. Right? Was it more or less this way? Yeah, it's that way because you have to, rather than telling your agents what they have to do exactly, you want to specify the outcome of the promise. And you have to somehow agree about that. And then you may even let them, uh, I don't know, the room may be tied up in 30 minutes, they will take two hours and do their own way, that's fine, as long as the end result is what we have agreed upon, right? You have children, I see your face. <laughs> Not yet teenagers, just wait. <laughs> All right, last concept, super agents. It's not about the car. Wow, is that that reaction? <laughs> okay, I have to read again. So according to Mark, a super agent is just a collection of agents that form a collaborative role of underlying promises to work together. Ooh. Okay, decompile. This is a car. And the car makes at least one simple promise to enable you to drive from one place to another. Right? There is this big object that makes, for example, this simple promise. But actually, it's not, if you look deeply into it, it's not just a single agent. There is a whole universe of small agents and relationships and promises made from one agent to the others. They are very different from the final promise of the whole system, but all of them cooperate to make the promise that this big thing is doing. 
Why this is important? We are getting there in one minute. But is this clear? So this is, you can think of uh, this thing as a single agent promising you something, or you can, you may want to go a bit deeper. For example, you want the car to promise to be blue instead of red, if you don't like the red color, whatever. Put it all together. Oh, it was about time, right? Do you remember this picture? So this was a diagram of the situation I was in when I joined the company. And uh, to a good extent, I'm still in that situation. Well, if you think a bit about that, you can model this situation with promise theory. Because if those people that I point to, so this is me, I don't ever wear ties, but yeah, couldn't find a better picture. So. And all these people are helpers. Well, if you think about that, helpers are agents promising to do something for me. And I'm an agent using their promises. Besides, I'm also a super agent representing an IT team that is making promises to the rest of the company. Right? Does it make sense to you? Yes. yes. Okay, so what are the consequences of, of this? Well, the point of using uh, a theory, the point of using something, uh, so think about a physical phenomenon, for example. You have a physical phenomenon, you observe that phenomenon, and you know that there are certain equations that explain what's going on. But since you have the equations, you may understand that there, is, there may be another phenomenon that you haven't observed, but it's actually possible. So you may design an experiment and see if that actually matches. So the point of having a theory backing what you're going to do is that you may go beyond what you currently see, which is quite important to me at least. So what are the advantages? Well, first thing, I think it's an advantage I'm not imposing to people. Those people are voluntarily helping me. You don't want to press them too hard because they may change their mind. If you start to put in pressure, if you start to stress them, they may uh, just decide to yeah, go to hell, I have another job to do, I have another boss, what do you want from me? But considering them as agents who are making promises and they may not be able to keep those promises because they have other managers and other priorities, which may be conflicting. It's fine. As long as you know that this is going to happen and you plan for that in some way, it's fine. If you promise for what they are promising to you, and don't just go out and say that you will, will do more than you, you can actually do, it's fine. Right? Basically, if you base what you promise on what the others can promise to you, first, you know what you can expect, you know what is a stretch, and you know what you can do. Isn't that valuable? I think it is. For me, it is. But you can do more than that. That's the using the theory to expand the horizon that I was talking about one minute ago. What if you use promise theory to design processes? Processes that can work without the police, ensuring that people will actually abide by your process. What if you use promise-based leadership with a direct report to which, in theory, to whom in theory you could impose? Who says that working by imposition is better than working by promises? So, concrete examples. First example, yeah, uh, one thing you may recognize some patterns from other 
you know, agile development, Scrum, whatever. It's not that I copied anything. It's that actually some of that may actually be modeled with promise theory and there is some uh, intersection here. That was not intended, but that's what happens. How do we do the weekly planning using promise theory, for example? Well, at the start of a new week, we'll have some uh, things that are left over from the previous week, some things that are still in flight, some things that must enter, we must do by this week because there is a, de a deadline, for example. So we sit and we see this big line of things that we, in theory, we should do by this week. Okay, but the question is, what can I actually promise to do by this week? And based on that, and based on the urgency, and based on all the values that are important for the task that you have at hand, you pick up only those that you can promise. There may be some that are a stretch, like, okay, if I do these two things and I'm fast enough, I may be able to do this third thing. So I know that this third thing is probably a stretch. And then there will be some things that, okay, it's clear, you cannot do that. So you do your planning knowing what each person can actually do. It's a bit difficult because we are uh, used to think in terms of uh, urgency and importance. So we put all the things that are important and urgent in our list and we say, yeah, we'll do that, we'll do that by this week. But the fact that they are in the list, it's not a guarantee that they will happen. Writing them in the list is not going to make them happen by itself. So instead of cheating on ourselves, why not invert the perspective and think of what we can reasonably do? and also stretch us a bit just so that we don't feel too comfortable. Does it work? Well, I would say it's okay. We are still influenced by this uh, thing of urgency and, influence and uh, importance, so we tend to overpromise still. But I would say that it's working well enough. Open problems? Well, one for all, we are two people in the team. Does it scale to larger teams? I don't know. But if you buy me three, four people, then I will tell you next year. Okay. All right. Pretend I never said that. Establishing processes. I can make the real example because we have just eight minutes and uh, if you have questions, I would like to take them. But basically, instead of the, the concept is, instead of designing your proce the processes for your company based on uh, your vision of the reality and then trying to impose your process to everyone, you should think that it's the process that must adapt to people, not the other way around. Anyone who likes the way that their company does, the, for example, the expense notes, you do. Take a picture. You will never see anyone ever to say that. So, Nick likes that. Noted. Better than anything else, any other that I've experienced. Are you doing it with Emacs? <laughs> okay, 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 stop. We don't have the time. <laughs> stop that. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, the point is, uh, it's much better if you try to understand what people can actually promise, what kind of process they are able to follow, they may have to stretch a bit, but in the end, if you manage to create a process based on what people can promise, you won't need any police to ensure that people actually do that. So it, in theory, it scales. Uh, it works for us, but I don't think that a one-year experience like mine is enough to say that it works in general. I think it works. What, what we have done in this way works pretty well, I would say. But, yeah, for scale, again, if you buy me three, four people more, we'll, we'll see. Uh, who knows or uses OKR? One, two, three, okay, too few. 
So OKR in 60 seconds. Uh, you may want to watch the video from uh, Google Ventures uh, if this seems interesting, but basically it's a way to have a company goal and fraction it in sub goals, for example, the, for the several divisions that are in the company and then fraction and fraction down the hierarchy until you have objectives for every person and uh, you attach to each objective some key results that are measurable so that you can actually decide if the objective was reached, half reached or not. That's 60 seconds, there is more than that. Watch the video, we don't have the time. Uh, so the problem here... No, let's not talk about the problem, how we do that. More or less like the weekly planning with an addition. We also have a yearly objective or set of objectives that we want to reach this year. So we have some guidance about what we want to do. It's not just a week by week thing or quarter by quarter. So again, we look at what we have left over from the previous quarter, what we have for the yearly, yearly strategy, and we decide, we put everything on the table. And then, okay, what can we actually promise of these objectives? Hmm. Okay, so again, we'll take some that we can do, some that will be a stretch, and the rest, yeah. Next iteration. Does it work? Well, it did it very well in the beginning because we were putting too much focus on uh, help desk. We have shifted the focus and the results are coming. Question again, not tested at scale, so who knows if it works on a wider scale than this. Um, so if I talk over this thing, we don't have the time for questions. So uh, let's make a check. Is there anyone who has questions at this point? One, one. Okay, so let's take the question first and then if there is some time we can talk about this. What's the question? Uh, very simple. Uh, are you tracking this uh, as something digital? Like, do you, so how do you check if you kept the promise? Like, how do you communicate that? What tools are you using? Okay. So uh, the question is about tooling. We use uh, Jira and Confluence, basically. Uh, for the weekly planning, we just make a page for this week. We connect the page, the, the items in the page, task in the page with the uh, Jira uh, tickets, for example. And then we look if we are good enough in keeping the things or not. There may not be also Jira tickets, and that's also fine. For example, we don't open Jira tickets for writing documentation, but we still have the items in our list for the week, for example. Other questions? One, two, three, okay. So, OKR again, how this could be expanded to an entire company? Well, in this way that seems quite complicated at first. So basically, uh, let's say that this boy at the left side is a CEO and he, makes a, he proposes a goal. The people just below him should be able to understand if the goal that he's proposing is reachable in his department and challenge that if needed. So you have a, like a loop of negotiation at this level and then this basically proceeds until it reaches the the end of the hierarchy and then back until you have a long chain of promises from the bottom up. Because the bottom up is the part that is missing in OKR. It's just top down. And uh, if uh, they decide at the top that you have an objective that you cannot keep, the fact that it's fractioned in uh, many people doesn't make it more possible. You may argue that this would take quite a long time to converge. And uh, I would say it's not the only problem. The first problem that you have, it requires these people at each level understand what their team can do. That's the first problem. If you want to reduce these loops, the team leaders must have an idea of what their people can do. And the second thing, 
team leaders may must have the possibility to challenge their directors. If a company doesn't allow for that, if you have just to say yes, whatever happens, then this cannot work. But that's not the kind of a company that you can apply this either. Can it work? Well, for uh, machines, it works. Have you recognized this pattern? That's more or less the same thing. I know that it's much easier with machines than with humans. Humans are complicated and there is no way to fix them with programs, unfortunately. But in theory, it can work if there is the right people and the right company, the right culture. So, summing up, I'm out of time. Promise based leadership. What do we have to gain from applying promise theory to leadership? Well, better relationships within the team, for sure. More realistic goals than just do this, do this, whatever, however. And uh, they help team leaders to set the right expectations for the team to other parts of the company. How can it work? If you don't work by imposition, if you don't uh, feel the need to make people understand who's the boss here, and if the company allows people to challenge their managers and say, no, we cannot do that, let's talk about that, let's find something that is more, more reasonable. If that can happen, this is not going to work. Sorry. Thank you.